What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of The Sheehan Show here on Sherdog.com. My name is Sean Sheehan. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today by Mike Pendleton to look ahead to another PFL card. This time it's PFL A2024, the playoffs, um, which goes down on the Hard Rock Live in Hollywood, um, Florida. I was going to say Hollywood, California there, but it's Hollywood, Florida. And we have the light heavyweights and the lightweights in action uh, here. Mike, how are you? Are you looking? I assume you're looking forward to this card. This is this is our second time um, jumping in to do one of these previews. The first, the first card turned out pretty good, and uh, and it was a, uh, it was probably I would say maybe the weakest of the the three cards on paper, but it turned out pretty good. This is a pretty strong card, all, all told. I know we have the top four fights, and we'll touch on some of the other ones. We're going to mostly concentrate on the top four, but I assume you're looking forward to this. It's a pretty good, pretty strong card here, isn't it? Yeah, especially because I was in Salt Lake City for round two of the PFL, you know, regular season for the, these two divisions, uh, lightweight and, and light heavyweight. Yeah, I'm fired up for this card. It's not only Hollywood, Florida. It's not only you know, lightweights and light heavyweights. It's Kill Cliff FC against American Top Team, which is right in the heart of, of where this, this event will be taking place. So, I mean, we've got all the makings of, of a civil war here in Florida. I always find that interesting, right? Because if I was doing this preview for my by myself, I would never have brought that up because I am the worst at knowing who coaches who or what teams. But you know what? The PFL and Bellator before them as well are actually really good at. They're good at doing that. Like when they come to Ireland as well, it's not so much gym versus gym, actually. A lot of people say they could be better at, <laughs> at that, although they have got a little bit better at it, I think, and may, may continue. But they are good at making local... Um, you know, specialities. They're good at giving people, like Bellator when they used to go to Hawaii. I used to give them tremendous use when they used to go to Hawaii. I just think they did a great job, obviously. But they had, you know, Ali Malay at the time as well, which was, was good, and Yancy Medeiros and others as well. But, um, you know, to, to hear that's the case here, it's it's very, very good as well. As someone who was obviously on the other side of the uh, of the Atlantic, and has never, have I been to Florida? No, I haven't been to Florida. Um it's it's a real strong uh, hotbed, isn't it, for MMA in Florida with all the gyms and everything? And I assume there'll be a big crowd. There, there used to be a thing before that uh, Florida, Florida crowds didn't travel. That's no longer the case, I would I would imagine, is it? No, I don't think you can't travel. Like, when you have the amount of talent they have, there's no way you don't travel, right? And it's the only thing you can do. And now I think that, I mean, at the Hard Rock, in the heart of, like, the, one of the best parts in Florida, in my opinion, there's not many great parts of Florida, but this is probably the one that's the most tolerable uh, you're you're right in the middle of everything, and, and really, you you know the MMA world you know better than most. There's not many better gyms. There's very good gyms, not many better than Kill Cliff and ATT. And, and I know we're gonna talk from the technical side, but from my side, the personable side of things, I don't know two gyms that stand out more for developing great people and not just great fighters. And both these gyms do that. And when you have great people to lead into it. When you have great people, you're going to sell out and you're going to bring a big crowd. So it, it should be a great, great, great event. Yeah, I've heard even, you know, on the Killcliff side of it, obviously, from the uh, Irish point of view, I've seen Ian Gary, obviously, was over there and Paul Hughes is there as well. So it's only heard good things about that gym, especially. And obviously, we know ATT has been around for a very, very long time. And I suppose the, the top fight is that with um, Imbe Kasang and I from Killcliff against uh, Joshua Silvera, who's obviously the son of Conan Silvera, who has... Uh, I've been anyone who listens to this show knows I've been very impressed with him even before he made his uh, season debut. Let's put it in the, in the PFL and came in to um, you know to uh, a short notice one at, at the start if, I, if I'm not mistaken, and then obviously was in the the whole season for the last while. Uh, Impan and Joshua have fought before. They fought in 2023, which is weird because it feels like it feels like a million years ago, even though it was less than it was it less than a year ago. It was less than a year ago. Yep, uh, yep. <laughs> which you know, Impa's obviously gone on and fought Johnny Eblen and had these two fights this year since Joshua has gone on uh, and only had two fights since I suppose fighting Sadabusi and and Rob Wilkinson. But he to me feels like a different fighter now. I I, I say that with Joshua, but. You look at a guy like him, you know, who is only 16 fights into his career. What was he, like 10 fights into his career when he came to the BFL? He's 31, but I think he's, you know, he's a young 31. Obviously, he had a a career before um, getting into mixed martial arts, especially at this sort of level, I suppose. I I think he's really in the, you know, I think Gisangani is probably hitting his prime right now or maybe has in the last year or maybe 18 months. 
I think Silvera is still on his way to the prime. So you look at some fights, even, you know, people have seen this by the, but the, the Spivak Tibora fight. I feel like the two of them lads are kind of the exact same place they were f- three or four years ago when they fought as they are now. I feel it's a little bit different with these two. I think Kasangalai is probably as good of a fighter, if not a tiny bit better. I think Silvera is a lot better. Now, is he good enough to actually go out and beat him? But uh, this time, we'll talk about that in a second. But. Have you seen those same improvements? Even though, okay, it's look, he's one and one since the first fight. But I think even what came before the the fight against uh, Impa Kasang and I, and you know the, the the kind of the run of improvement he's been on, it's a, it's Silvera is becoming one of those guys. It's going to be a mainstay in this division and might end up winning it at some stage. Sean, I don't know that many people are more rightfully so critical of judging and just overall scoring and all that. I'd love to hear if, if you can recall it, just your take on the uh, Josh and, and Rob fight. It was incredibly close. And I only bring that up because when you talk about growth, you're talking about a guy who took on a former champ in, in Rob Wilkinson. And, and w- just in not terms of, of a technical side, but when I had talked to Josh when the season started, his point was, let me beat all the former champs. Let me beat former champs along the way to becoming a champ for the first time. And when you have that mindset and another thing that I think maybe mentally freed him was he was no longer allowing himself to be defined by the result inside the cage. We know this. It, it's, it's been a story through time. Fighters carry their result with them. They carry it in for the next five fights. They hold on to five fights before that. They always, they don't look ahead, you know, and when you free yourself from those shackles, I think it makes you a better fighter. And, and to that point, when your dad's Conan Silvera and you're at American top team, I don't know if you could have a better freeing release than going there, finding yourself, and then getting better. He's improved every single fight. Uh, I think the proof is in the pudding. I think there's a real conversation to have about the result against Rob Wilkinson, but that's a topic for another day. And it's the same with Impa Kasunganai. So I agree with you 500%. Impa has said all year long, dominance, 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 dominance. That's all I want is to dominate. And he's done so. Now the Jakob Neto fight, you know, we saw we saw a little adversity, but what 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 an exclamation point he had there. So here here is a case now of Josh wants his revenge, and Impa wants to keep going, and, and I think the biggest storyline, if you will, into this is how much does Impa Kasung and I want to separate himself from the rest of the pack in the PFL light heavyweight division, or does Josh want to? Take that from him. And, uh, man, they're two skillful guys. I agree with you, So I would even say Josh is not even at his prime yet. I think he can keep growing. This is such an intriguing fight. Yeah, I, I, it is very intriguing. And I think, the, uh, just to touch on the Wilkinson fight, I was reading back through my notes, actually, funnily enough. And I, 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 you know it's one of those fights, right? You said he'd take the result with you. But I think there's two, two, there's another two things you can do, right? You can take the performance with you, right? in a positive and negative way. So you look at that performance, you go in there against Rob Wilkinson, as you said, a former champion, I know from the weight class down, but still, you know, you could you could argue Rob Wilkinson is a natural 2 of fiver, but we leave that, as I said, for another day. Right, you take that positive with you, that you could have won that fight. You look at, at Joshua Silvera, right, and you know how good he's wrestling is, getting on top. What you have to do is learn from that fight. You need to land more shots when you get on top. You need to do more damage when you get on top. You need to attack a little bit more when you get into, not not just on the ground, but into any position where you can do it and turn that fight from a split decision his way, you know, to maybe a majority decision your way, wherever it might be, or, or a unanimous decision, sorry, your way. And it's the perfect fight to learn from because he lost, he's still qualified and he can still win the million. So at the end of the day, the result actually didn't matter a, a jot. Now, you could argue he'll have an easier uh, finale if he's to beat Kasangana here, but you could also argue he's going to have two tough fights maybe instead of one tough fight. Uh, but we leave that again for, for a second. I think this fight comes down to if um, Silvera can adjust and implement a game, a winning game plan. It, it's, as, it's as simple as that. We, we see rematches all the time, and they're, they're often very, very uh, different from each other. Now, we, we watch, you know, you watch fighter A versus B fight once, and it goes a certain way. You might watch them fight again, it'll go the exact same way. They might fight a third time, and it'll go the exact same way again. You go watch them fight once, 
here we'll give the example of uh, a fight that happened recently um but i'm Muhammad and leon edwards that first fight Leon came out, he pushed the pace, Bilal couldn't get a takedown, he dominated him, he was going to win the fight, let's be honest here, there was night book. The second fight, Bilal come out, comes out, he pushes the pace, he takes him down, he dominates him for large portions of the fight. Totally different. Joshua Silvera is going to have to do what Bilal Muhammad did. He's going to have to find different entries, different ways of beating him, do like, you know, smart like Bilal did. Because Kasang and I... He's a very solid fighter. You know, he's good takedown defense. He's good wrestling himself. He's good offensively and defensively on the ground. And he's very, very good striking as well. You know, Kasanga, one of those, one of these guys, I think, you know, and I, I've spoken to him before about this. It, it's tough when you are at the wrong side of one of the most replayed clips in the history of the sport. For him to come back, the mental strength he has showed to come back and implement you know, what he is as a fighter on all of his fights has been massive. So you, there's no questioning like, oh, you know, you, you, for a lot of guys in, you know, you beat him the first time, you beat him pretty handily. Is there going to be a mental lapse maybe that will have you lose this? I don't think that's a question because I'm going to, I would rule that out straight away. I think if Silvera wins this fight, he'll win it on merit and game planning and ability and all of that. So I take that straight out of it. <sighs> I'll give my pick here, for, uh, uh, first of all, in a quick breakdown, then you can do the same. I think Silvera will struggle for those takedowns again. I think Kasanganai is just too good. I think Kasanganai will, you know, if he wins uh, the, the that kind of battle early, but also the kind of the transitional battle early, if there is a bit of a takedown or a clinch, I think it's going to be a long night for Joshua Silvera because the second... You stuff one of those that gets back to the feet, you get a little bit more tired. The second time you do it, a little bit more tired. The third, and by the time you come to the third and fourth, or the, sorry, the, the second and third round, it, that's going to be an impact of saying, and I fight because he is used to that. And I think he's probably just going to take it from there. I could see maybe the same result as the first time. I think Impa Kasang and I, by unanimous decision, maybe get a later finish, but I think uh, I fancy Impa to win this. What, what, what way do you think the fight will go, first of all, and who are you picking? Well, I'm going to just start off and, and just give my pick right away. And I'm going to ride with you on the same thing. It's going to be Imba Kasunganai. But I, I will say this. When we talk about fighter improvements, I think overall, when we look at fighter improvements, not just in this fight, but I, I'd say overall, I don't know if anyone has grown from you know 2023 to 2024 as much as Josh Silvera has. And I do think he'll welcome more striking and stand up here. But you're right. If he wants to get this W, which he is very capable of doing, I'm not counting him out by any means. He is going to have to find those entries. He is have to. He is going to have to secure those takedowns, hold the pressure, keep the pressure. And, and I'm not saying it, it would be wise to stand and strike with Impa Kasunganai because very few people want to do that. But I think he's more open to it than he would have been a year ago. So I will still lean Impa Kasunganai by unanimous decision. But I wanted to lay out a path like you did uh, for Josh Alvera to win this fight. Because whatever it says on paper, you know, there's that added of they've already been here. And like you so uh, very well said earlier, what, what narrative changes this time? And how does it change? And if it doesn't change, the result stays the same. I, I think we, that, that's pretty much the proof is in the pudding there. So um, I think we're going to see growth from both fighters. But I think when I have to make a prediction, and bye-bye, you know, it's decision. Yeah, I, I think it'll be a better fight than the last one as well. I think it's going to be, especially early days, I think there's going to be a, a, a lot of fun transitions in there, so let's uh, let's look forward to that one. Uh, let's talk about the other light heavyweight fight, uh, Rob Wilkinson and uh, uh, Dolcian Yashimuradov. And it's funny, if you'd asked me about the two of these lads a year ago, 18 months ago, I would have spoken very positively about Wilkinson and not negatively about Yashimuradov, but like in a, in a less positive fashion. I actually think that's kind of flipped for me. <clears throat> we spoke about the uh, Wilkinson... And Silvera fight, as well as Silvera fought in that, I didn't think Wilkinson was amazing in that fight. Obviously, he didn't have long against Tom Breeze. But I've been very, very impressed with Yashi Mordov. You, you mentioned uh, Jacob and I earlier on and how well he did against uh, Impa. You know, Yashi Mordov made mince meat of him. He destroyed him in round. And I've watched all of his fights. I was at one of his fights last year. Obviously, he came through the PFL Europe. And I'm 
very high on, on Jacob. I think he's a very, very good fighter. So for him to win that fight, also very high on Simon Biang. He won that. The fight before, Magic Rosansky. I know a lot of people, Magic hasn't won a lot of fights recently, but this guy is a real tough guy, you know, coming out of the European scene as well. And it was just unfortunate for him. He got in there against the likes of Carl Moore and a few others as well. But I remember looking at Yasha Mordov before the Corey Anderson fight for the first time. Um... And this was his first fight, I believe, in, in Bellator after fighting in ACA and ACB and M1 and, and ACA and a few other places. And I remember watching, I was like very impressed with him. And he came into that fight against Corey Anderson and he was not good. And then he lost to Carl L. Brexton after that. And I kind of wrote him off a little bit, which I suppose was, was a little bit unfair. And I think it's showed that it's unfair now because he's a this guy is, is a very, very good fighter. He's a good wrestler. He, you know, he can hit as well on the feed. Um, and... I think if Rob Wilkinson is not on it here, I think he will lose. So Rob Rob is going to have to get back to what he was a couple of years ago, you know, use his long jab, use his striking, really good takedown defense against the cage as well. He's going to need all of that to win this fight. I'll, I'll be honest, I'm still sitting here unsure of who I'm even going to give as my pick here in a couple of minutes. Maybe, maybe you'll help me decide. How do you see this fight going? What do you think of it? Well, I'll tell you this. If Rob doesn't show up, Dovlet's a guy that can put him away, you know, like you said. And, you know, with that many knockouts to his credit, as Rob Wilkinson, look, these are two names that aren't jumping off, you know, the billboards for everybody, but this could be an absolute war of a fight, which comes down for me. If you're not all the way checked in, Dovlet's winning this fight. Now, that's not my pick. I am going to take Rob Wilkinson by uh second round finish uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna go tko but um it could very well just like the main event could very well go the other way i i think i'm gonna go with yash Mordov. I, I think i'm gonna pick him and i uh i this I did. is better when we disagree it is i went with jenna bishop the last <laughs> time and that didn't work out so well but anyway i'm gonna go with him anyway you know he probably won't thank me for it but i just feel <sighs> I, do you know what I and I think uh, our good friend uh, Mookie uh, over on uh, over on Twitter, former bloody elbow uh, legend, uh, used to always talk about how uh, momentum doesn't exist in sport, and I used to always buy into it to be honest, and I I still do, but I don't know what the, the change in momentum for both of these guys, and not, you know it's funny to say that because look, Rob Wilkinson has won both of his fights this year, it's, but the, that performance. It, it wasn't his best. I think Yash Mordov has been very, very good. As I said, look, if Rob comes out and performs his best, if he performs 100%, I think he will win. But I just don't know if he is going to do that. So that's why I'm going to go with, uh, with Yash Mordov to win this. So um, we're, we're looking at an interesting final, um, you know, Impa. Uh, we were both predicting there. So is he going to fight Wilkinson or, uh, or Yash Mordov? I think he'll be... Uh, It'll be interesting to see that. Obviously, uh, he's never fought Wilkinson before, uh, and he's never fought Yash Mordov either, so it'll be a brand new final if that happens. And Silvera hasn't fought... Well, Silvera fought, obviously. Um, Silvera fought uh, Rob, so that could be the only uh, what, rematch there as well. So we and what see. a fun narrative that would be, right? If yeah. Josh pulls off the win, uh, gets his rematch against Impo, wins that, gets his rematch against Rob, wins that to become a world champ. I mean... That's what the PFL Hollywood script is. Uh, the the script writers are writing there, right? That's how PFL makes movies off of that shot. I'm telling you, we'll, we'll we'll see how that another split decision. In it. <laughs> so, uh, let's talk about the uh, lightweights and uh, let's look first at uh, Gabzi Rabadanov uh, against uh, Michael Dufour. Um, I think a lot of people at the start of this year, if you told them that Dufour would be in this position, they would have. Uh, they would have laughed just, especially when he's given Mads Burnell. Obviously, he went in and, and lost Adam Piccolati. It didn't matter in the end. But what a performance that first fight was. Again, if you're talking about um, the movement of positivity versus negativity, Piccolati fight wasn't a great performance, you know, and you're kind of thinking, yourself, Mads Burnell is one of those guys that... You know, he doesn't seem to care. I remember, I remember I asked him a question at a press conference about, and I, I love saying jujitsu doesn't work in MMA, as a lot of people don't know. And I asked him about it, and he was like, completely agreed with me. He's like, no, nah, jujitsu is rubbish. And he, you know, he's one of those guys. And I, I genuinely think he doesn't care. And I think he went out into that fight and he was like, well, I'm just going to have fun here. Whatever happens. Now, take nothing away from Do. And I feel like that has taken a bit away from Do for. But this is going to be. 
a, a tougher test uh, against Rabadanov, 22 and 4. You know, not the most finishes in the world, I suppose. 11 decisions and 11 finishes uh, in uh, in the win column for him. He's, you know, beaten Espinosa and Rinfro to decisions this year after obviously being in, in, in Bellator. Look, we know what he's like as a fighter. This, look, this, do you know what this is really? This is two well rounded guys, uh, you know, who maybe could catch each other. Maybe. On, on the feet, maybe could catch each other on the ground. Um, obviously, after what Dufour did to um, to Mads Brunel and having 10 submissions out of 13 wins on his record, you'd fancy if he's going to win, maybe that's the way he'll do it. But against Rabadanov, is that, you know, is that a likely outcome? I suppose he's been submitted once in his career. Uh, I'm I'm excited about this fight because, I, do you know what I think it'll be? I think... I, I love uh, transitions is my word for it. I love transitions. I love close battles in parts of fights. Now, I don't know if it'll be a close fight in totality, but I think there will be parts of this fight that will be very exciting. Um, but I do think in the end that Rabadanov will get through it. I just think the wrestling and the top game might be a little bit too much, especially if Dufour is looking for submissions and looking to fight on the ground. I think that might be an issue. But, like, you know, we see here his association on Sherdog.com. Abdul Manap Nur- Nurmagomedov school, uh, as uh, as one of the my uh, listeners tells me often, never back against an Abdul Manap Nurmagomedov student, and I, I won't be doing that here. W- will you be back against him? Who are you going for? I will because oh, um, Michael Dufort has two golden checks sitting above him in his gym every day in Canada, and that is from OAM, a man who understood the PFL format a man who understood what it took to become world champion multiple times through. And Michael Dufour, for lack of, there's no better way of putting it, Sean, he realized very quickly how quickly this could have been taken from him. He had the celebration, just to put this in perspective, he had the celebration of the night in an event in which he lost because he made the playoffs. And that is the beauty of the PFL, but that is the reality of what Michael Dufour. So his back's already been against the wall. And Gats, Gats is very, very good. You know, he's got a loss in every which way, like two KOs, one submission, one decision. Um, and I don't respectfully see Michael Dufour knocking him out or putting him away. But because, for purposes of this show, I'm going to call for a third round submission from Michael Dufour. He's fired up. He knows what's what what he's fighting for because it's right there, and he also knows how quickly it could have been taken from him. So when you say these, this is a fight put with uh, you know two of the most well-rounded guys, I think it's just who's the most rounded on the night, and that's who's going to come out victorious. For me, it'd be Godsey by decision, but my pick is Michael Dufort by submission, third round. It's interesting because there's always one that stands out like that. I haven't seen the odds yet, but I would I would garner that Rabatanov would be a pretty sizable favorite here. But there's always one, you know, that's thrown in there that puts, you know, puts people off and there's a... There's a it, you mean it, like Donna Bishop? Well, I was, I'll tell you though, she was winning that fight until she lost it, you know. <laughs> as as I love to say on my, my betting show when I pick a wrong bet, but um, you'll never know. You'll never know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Um... And in the final of the four playoff fights uh, is Bryn Primus against Clay Collard. You mentioned a minute ago there about the format. And I, I was sitting down to do the preview for the very first card of the year, or the, the first card that Primus was on of the year anyway. And I just, as I was speaking, I kind of, I, I, I came to the realisation that this is the perfect format for Bryn Primus. He's this type of guy, you know, that he's, he's a bit of a snaky fighter. He'll find his way through things. He'll find ways to win fights without taking a whole load of damage or getting quick finishes or, you know, and... There a lot of you know what I think it hurts a lot of people in the PFL. They don't know what to do. They don't know whether to go for a quick finish, just try to win the fight, do it like a normal fight, like a normal fifteen minutes, or to go all out. I you know I need to finish this quickly. I uh, he is perfect for this, and so far you know two submission wins, second round, third round, beat two good guys in Bruno Miranda and Solomon Rinfro, and he's coming up a guy. You know obviously we know if people don't know, Bryn Primus has been in. Bellator since since God was a boy really made his debut in Bellator in 2013 and he was only fighting once a year for about seven years so <laughs> you know it's, it's funny to see him in this but he's coming up against Clay Collard who's been in PFL 
you know, since God was a binary, since uh, it, it feel, it's it's only twenty. Is it only twenty twenty one? It feels longer than twenty twenty one to be honest, because he's had about thirty fights in the PFL. <laughs> Look, he lo- he lost to Mads Burdell, but he beat Patricky earlier on the year and arguably fight of the year in the PFL so far. Um, I'm, re- do you know what? We'll we'll get into the pick and the breakdown of it in a second, but I'm really looking forward to this fight. I I cannot wait for it. I think Kyle Collard is the type of guy who will welcome what Bryn Primus does. You know, welcome him being a little bit tricky and looking for things. And I'm sure I can. I can. Do you know what? How I picture this fight when I look at it. Bryn Primus like falling back after getting jabbed and in like going for like a heel hook or something and Clay Collar just pulling his leg out and just falling down and punching him in the face. That's that's what I view and I don't know who will win or how it'll go. That's how I view in this fight. It's just a funny, fun, quality fight. How, how do you think it'll go? Well, I want to throw this disclaimer out there, and I'm and I'm nobody in terms of you know those who will watch this show. So I'm like the new guy in the party, right? But here's a disclaimer to all future PFL fighters. Everyone talks about the points and and the standings and all of that. How about fight your fight in the first round and let's put all the anticipation into the second round. As an American here in the States, it's like the regular season in the National Football League. We don't give a damn for the first half of the season. And then when the playoffs are are here, we want to start figuring out who needs to beat who so our team can be where, right? So everyone should just fight their fight in the first round of the regular season. Yes, PFL awards, you know, with the point system finishes. But if you fight your fight and you don't go, like you said, they don't know what to do in the first fight. Who cares? Just fight your fight. Don't go, don't, don't be a point chaser. That that's that's what it comes down to. With that being said, uh, I'm so excited. If I, if I can, I'd like to mention to you what I shared with you before we started recording that Clay Collard told me. So just to preface this for those who will watch this, Clay Collard told me he plans on making this the most boring Cassius Clay fight of all time. Love it. <laughs> uh, because he is sick and tired, and I'm not uh, quoting, I'm paraphrasing, but he's sick and tired of being, uh, you know, held down, not taking any damage, people just laying on top of him, and him losing the fight that way. He told me he put on gloves one time ahead of this ahead of this fight. He has only focused on the ground game here. So I'm excited to see what that version of Clay Collard we get. I think the world forgets. We got introduced to Clay Collard because he was some MMA guy who went into top rank boxing and started knocking off every prospect during COVID. You know, we weren't having a lot of MMA fights. And then he carried that momentum with him into the PFL. And it's just been a consistent pursuit of that championship. Now, Brent Primus, extremely slicky and, and, and tricky for that matter. Uh, I am super, I share the same excitement with you though. Um, I'm going to let you make your pick first though. Um, <laughs> because I, listen, I'm just overall excited for this fight, especially after talking to Clay and hearing that mindset. Me too. And I don't like giving my, picks. I, I, do you know what? I'm going to pick Clay, Clay Collard. Even though I, I've said since the very start that I, I think Ben Primus might actually win the whole thing, I, I just feel like Clay won't play into the bullshit. Maybe you know, and I know what he told you. I, I do I fully believe him? I'm not. I'm not sure if I fully believe him. To be honest, maybe that's maybe he's hoping that Brent hears that. <laughs> you know, type of thing. So no, I'm gonna pick pick Clay Callard. I think he's jab. His outside work, his ability to kind of stay away from guys. I don't think Brent is necessarily the best wrestler in the world, but he will get you down. It. Clay has fought a lot of those people recently, and I think he'd be okay. And I think he'd probably win the decision. What, what do you think? Oh, I hate to always agree with you, but so far, here we are. I'm going to agree. I'm going to say Clay Collard by decision. And it doesn't take, again, doesn't take anything away from Brent Primus. But, man, I think there's an extra layer of motivation and not showing it to the world. Because I really, if I can say for myself, I don't think Clay Collard cares about what the world thinks. Um, but I know that he knows this. He's been at this point multiple times. He's been inside the PFL playoffs multiple times. And what's it going to take? We've already seen this, right? We've seen what we've seen it with Dennis Goltsoff in the first event of the playoffs this year, a guy who's been here but has yet to win the gold. So I, I think Clay's going to do what he has to do to get it done. And sort of, it's, it's a pretty good card, L-squared. I know, like, okay, we're not going to delve massively into all of these fights, but... 
What I really like is Carlisle Brexton versus Antonio Carlos Jr. Obviously, like, you could ar- argue that Shoeface has been one of the most unlucky guys in the PFL over the last few years. Obviously, he came in and he ended up winning it, and then there was injuries and other stuff. He lost Alex Pelizzi, and what a performance from Pelizzi that was um, this year. Um, and look, as with all of these fights in these weight classes, you'll be thinking if whoever wins this might be the one who will be a replacement if you know if someone was to, to get injured for the finale. We've seen Carl Brexton, obviously he lost, as I mentioned earlier on, to Carl Moore and uh, and Jeff ne- uh, Grant Neal, sorry, but he's a win over Yasha Mordov as well, which we mentioned. He won a fight outside of, of the PFL in Bellator, now he's back in with a chance. You know, the espinoza Burnell fight, just to touch on it quickly, we spoke about Espinosa earlier on, you know, he beat Piccolotti and we saw how good of a fight Piccolotti put on to beat Dufour this year and then Mads Brunel a similar sort of thing you know he lost to Dufour but then beat Claire Collard as well so all of these lads I think you know if any of them had to actually step in after winning these fights I think they're good replacements to have I'm gonna I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with Shoeface and Brunel in those two fights how would you think they'll go and who are you picking um, I'm gonna agree with you there um, I I mean listen Mads Brunel proved to, I think, all of us that he doesn't really care about anything except fighting, and he's going to do what he has to do to get the job done. Uh, Elvin Espinosa is very, very fun to watch, um, but I, I'm going to agree with you on both those picks, and I'll just really quickly say, uh, you know, a couple names I'm very excited for. We, we don't see many of them. Uh, Michelle Montague uh, and, and women's featherweight is going to be fun to watch. She's been snack snatching necks i believe all submissions have come in the first round um for michelle montague chris brown for those who don't know him is an action-packed fighter and uh he comes in on weight sean mark my words there's there's no better appetizer to this fight card than a, than chris brown being on that and if you're not happy with those two then i present to you danny sabatello and we'll just give him a microphone he he I, I just spoke to him before speaking to you today. He wants a 135-pound division in, in PFL in the future um, or a pay-per-view card. So the, the thing I like about these kind of uh, prelim fights for the playoff events, not always, but in, in this case with the Hollywood card, a lot of people campaigning for different things, whether it be a future spot on the PFL global season or another division or a big fight opportunity. A lot of good opportunity here. So I'm excited. Me too. Yeah, it's very interesting. Like, um, the Danny Sabatello fight. Watched a bit of his opponent, um, Lazaro Deiran. He's fought a lot in Combat Jay Global. I know this is his first. He's fought in Titan as well. When, and whenever you see guys have wins in places like that, you know they're going to be, they're not going to be bad, you know. Watch a bit of him. He's a dangerous guy. He's a, do you know what he has as well, which a lot of guys would, how many fights seen eight, eight fights into his career? He's a lot of experience. Like, if you look at his last few fights, he's won them all, but two rounds, three rounds, three rounds, three rounds, one round, three rounds, one round, three. That's a lot of rounds for a guy with only eight fights into his career. So I don't think that'll be a walkover, but you'd have to, to fancy um, to fancy Sabatello. Just on Montague as well, that she's something I definitely wanted to mention. Obviously, you know, her amateur career, she was an unbelievable amateur, one of the, you know, one of the best ever. She's come in. Um, you know, obviously she was fighting on, on the Dublin card, uh, beat Abigail Montes as well, you know, who beat uh the that that boxer who calls herself the greatest boxer of all time, even though she's second to Katie Taylor. Uh but uh, you know, she went in and beat Abigail Montes and she's very, very, very good as well. So I, I would agree with you on that. We've uh, uh Baggio Ali Walsh as well, who's moving up here and he's fighting a guy who's four and so that's a, a good test for him as well. And then uh, Jordan Oliver is also uh stepping up after his debut last time out, uh for a guy who's uh, five and three as well. So um yeah I, I uh I like the favourites in all of those, basically, Oliver Montague. I'll go with Sabatello as well. I think um, Baggio Ali Walsh will, will, will as well. Who's your pick for that? Taj John against uh, Chris Brown? Why do you, uh, you like Chris Brown, do you? I think, yeah, I think if Chris Brown, it, it's the only issue we've seen with him um, is just keeping the weight in check. When the weight's in check, he's on fire. And it's a little unfortunate for Chris Brown that that's his really only flaw because I think this opportunity would have come much quicker. So I'll take Chris Brown. And I just want to really quickly, and then I'm done on this card, um, unless you have more for me, but what a big step for both Jordan Oliver and Biagio Ali Walsh, right? Because let's just put it this way, Sean, they can't take a step back win or loss with wins. They have to immediately get into the, you know, the deeper waters, not, not necessarily right. You know, facing championship contenders, but there's no 
two and three or one and oh guys anymore if they get past these two challenges respectfully they're right into the thick of things and i think that's beautiful matchmaking by the pfl they get a lot of you know heat for people from people online i think this is fantastic yeah i love to see that as well because you know you've had plenty of as an amateur plenty before now is the time to do it. So we'll uh, we'll see if they can do it. Coming up here on uh, is it Friday night Saturday? It's on the sixteenth of August. Anyway, I never know because I'm in Ireland, so it could be Friday or Saturday for me. Friday. Now, but it's Friday night. Beautiful, Mike. Thank you very much for joining me. If you're not following him on Twitter, please do. He'll be tagged here and everywhere. You'll find him. Um, go on, tell us what it is. MP. Three, MP2310. MP2310. I've forgotten yep. that from last week, and I will continue to forget it as we go forward. But <laughs> thank you to everybody for listening. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Mike has interviews out with everyone, absolutely everyone. So check them out here on Shardog.com. Uh, and with that, we will leave you there, and we'll be back next week for another preview. Until then, thank you very much for tuning in. My name is Sean Sheehan for Shardog.com, and I'll see you all next time.